you're in the bullpen. You might want to watch where you're stepping. Here's American Shorthorn Association CEO, Monty Souls. Welcome to the Shorthorn Bullpen. This is Monty Souls, your host. And today we've got uh, two well-known people in our industry that's going to be with us today as we're going to talk about some information uh, of, of a symposium that the Shorthorn Breed is going to be sponsoring. And uh, we've got uh, Chip Kemp here from the American Cemental Association and IGS does a lot with the International Genetic uh, Solutions for us. And uh, we've also got Jay Carlson with Carlson Media Group, is that the right term? And he's been really quite enthusiastic about our, our symposium. So we're going to ask a few questions from him and let him know and, and let him uh, give you some information about uh, what we're going to be doing. And we want to really invite everyone. This is more than just for short horn breeders. It's uh, going to be a, a program that we think is very uh, educational, fun, and expose you to some different areas. So the night before, we're going to go to the brewery and to a distillery, and we're going to find out how they make bourbon, and then we're going to taste a little bit of it. So hopefully, we'll be ready to go the next morning. I will certainly be ready for the night before. We'll determine the next morning. Okay. So the topic that we really have for Chip written down here is uh, preparing your operation for the future. And so basically what we're going to do is a little bit what we're doing right now is we're going to banner back and forth a little bit and put some information back and forth and, and basically get Chip to share some of his thoughts with you. So as we look at what the things we can do for the future, just give me a short little window of the things that you see our industry need to really do to be prepared for the future. Well, I'm going to back up real quick and just reiterate what you said a moment ago. Uh, based on the schedule and the folks you've put together, I totally agree. This is for a large swath of folks, certainly shorthorn breeders, no question, and commercial folks using that. But I think anybody who's vested and has a passion for the beef business is going to benefit from this schedule that you all have put together. So um, I, I'd encourage and hope we could see a lot of folks there. So, yeah, to your, to your primary question, what are some of those pressures? Well, I think we just want to be honest with ourselves and what will be there is we'll talk about some of the things that are kind of poking our friends and neighbors a little bit and how are we going to ensure that their kids and grandkids got a snowball chance of being invested in this thing long term um, given some of those pressures. So one, all supply chain all the time, right? You don't go to a major industry meeting where packers or semen companies or, or uh, lots of breeders are involved where there's not somebody trying to corner the market on a particular supply chain. We can talk about some of the wisdom of that. I would also argue some of the naivete of that. Um, but it, it's a major force in our business and it affects all of our ability to engage in commerce. And so we want to talk about those things. Some of these firms that aid us in our business, again, those I mentioned along with DNA firms, along with um, you know folks who market feeder calves, they give us strong signals about what's most successful in their genre, right? How do we react to that? What do we find out when the local feeder calf buyer says, hey, this is what you need to do from a management standpoint to prepare your calves for success at this sale barn? Way too often, we kind of bristle up at that and say, well, don't tell me what to do. Well, fair enough, but then don't complain if the free market says, um, you're kind of outside of the bounds a little bit. So we're going to talk, I think, in that particular setting pretty extensively about some of those sort of outside pressures that that are facing us and our kids. And, and I think probably we're going to get to the weeds. I'm going to call it, we're going to go down in the weeds a little bit, talk about EPDs, technologies, and things that are going to be a little bit maybe future, and we may rub the crystal ball a little bit, but uh, there'll be some information here that uh, new technologies that are coming at us all the time. And that's what this whole program will be, is getting you prepared as, as we have put your herd in the winter circle we want everybody to get a win-win out of this and, and, and get an advantage from it. Jay, you have looked at this program and you gave me a call one day and you were totally excited and enthusiastic about it. Mm -hmm. tell, tell me, just tell the folks why you feel this is a very important end of what we do in our industry and why this particular schedule and program looks that appealing to you. 
as I looked at it for the first time and saw that just it's a great comprehensive uh, overview of the industry. It's not just about short horns, it's about breeding cattle, it's about um, it's about all kinds of uh, other things like components that go into be producing better beef. And the thing I like about it is, is that I, I love conferences and as we've talked about, um, because they give you, you know, in, in two cases, you're going to have speakers that are wonderful. They're what, you know, some of the best in the industry and you get to sit there and, and, and glean from them. And I encourage you to, whoever goes is, in, is there or whoever reads about what was, what was said, takes home one point that they try and incorporate um, into their, into their uh, outfits from each of these speakers. The second thing is, is that the tours we take, they provide access points that you would never have on your own. And myself personally, as I got thinking about it, I've been on a dairy farm in New York, uh, a uh, fruit farm up in the Northwest. I've been to the grain um, terminals in south of New Orleans. And those are all things that if Jay Carlson just called up with his wife, Linda, and said, hey, I'm coming for a visit, they'd say, great, you know, um, we're not gonna do anything with you. But in this case, you do. So you have complete access for knowledge that you never have otherwise. That's why we're in Lexington, if you really want to know. Our, our board of directors and discussion with our staff, we ended up wanting to be someplace a little different where we could do different things because there's carryover and there's a lot of similarities and we can learn a lot of different things. We go to a horse breeding outfit, you know, they're using genetics. They're doing them a little different. They may look at, at speed. They may look at some other things where we look at pounds of beef or something. Still relative. I mean, I, I'm interested, I'm getting excited about the bourbon guys because <laughs> first of all, we're gonna to get to sample it, but, but even probably more important, we're gonna learn some things there that are gonna be very relative to what we do in our industry as they look at the genetics that they deal with as they sit there and go through the science and the research that they're gonna make bourbon from because we're gonna get that to our, the Tipton uh, horse sales. It's marketing, it's our product. As purebred livestock producers, Marketing's a huge factor, and we've put a number of areas here. We got panels with auctioneers on them, sale managers, and and breeders that that are successful. We're going to be going out to the Boyd Beef Cattle, who's been a successful bull sale, put bulls into AI studs, and the whole picture that a purebred breeder needs to have. I don't care what breed it is. You know, we're, we're yeah, we're shorthorn, but I really don't care. We want to help folks understand this that you're going to have to help market your product. One of the things that I guess I have always felt, and I'm going to come back to you here when I make my comment a little bit, as beef cattle producers, ranchers and farmers, we dedicate our time, our energy, and our dollars to production. And how much do they really dedicate to marketing the product after they've produced it? So I'm going to ask you to make a comment or two on that first, Chip. Well... And kind of like where you start relative to the, to the combination of bourbon and beef, not only because it scratches a personal itch, but it reminds us that, that consumption in the moment is an emotive experience. People remember the best bourbon they had or the best steak they had, not just based on uh, the sniff of the bottle or the tenderness of that steak, but everything that was around that moment. And so to your point of how do we market a product? First, we have to look internal, right? Because we have to make a product that consumer wants. We have to ask them what it is they want. We have to build that. And then once we're confident we're building that, and that is different than saying, hey, I'm going to build X and push the rope through. Good luck with that. It's easier to say, okay, what's out there? What's the need? What can I fill? Let's build that. Now the marketing aspects, which Jay's certainly much more skilled in than I, um, but that gets a lot easier to market something that somebody already actually wants. They just exactly. have to know it. They need to communicate with you yep. and, and, and know about your program. No, that's exactly right. Jay, well, we're gonna let you, this, this is your cup of tea, basically, <laughs> or a cup of coffee, whatever you wanna yeah, call it. Yeah. But this is what you do for a living, is basically sell advertising and, and sell promotion to breeders to do this. So give us a little insight the way you look at this and what you see when I talk about, when you're trying to talk to breeders about spending money 
And I really honestly think that, you know, as, as, we, as we go through life that, you know, my philosophy and my friends will tell me, you know, that, uh, you know, yeah, it sounds like you, Jay. I always really believe, you know, nothing good happens until something sells. And so if you have the greatest product in the world, but you can't get it sold, that's not real, you know, that's not real useful. But in your point of taking it, you know, even the beef industry, as we all go all the way to the consumer, there's probably a, a little bit of a loss that we probably need to work on. And, and that is that once it leaves our place, then what happens to it? And through the technology that we have, we're, we're grasping more and more and through, um, you know, feedback on, on from feedlots is whether or not we own them all the way through or we sell them, there's, that's being, being done. But something I'll challenge people is, with is that years ago I was on a train going to downtown New York City and I was, I was calling on one of the animal health companies and I ran into a gentleman who was an attorney from, from New York and he said to me, Jay, he said, give me your 45 second elevator speech about the beef industry. And if you think about it, there's not a real good one. And so after many years and after conversing with the late Dave Nichols, we kind of came up with the largest economy in the world is the United States. Uh, one of the largest segments of the economy is agriculture. One of the largest segments of agriculture is the beef industry. And we have 700,000 dedicated cow-calf producers, you know, trying to breed better and feed better and produce better um, quality beef throughout the world, not just for the United States, because exports become increasingly important. So I'll go back to my thing that, that says, you know, nothing good happens until something sells. No, I, I fully, fully agree with you. And it's, it's what drives the market, it's what pays your bills. So it's that way all over the world. Without agriculture, we don't eat. But, but the things that we're gonna get back to here in Lexington is, you know, we're, we're gonna be there July 7th, 18th, 19th, and 20th. And the things we're gonna talk about, we got Dr. Troy Rowan coming and we've done a podcast, I think, with Dr. Rowan already. Uh, and he, he'll do some things for us on genetics and they're doing some interesting research there in the University of Tennessee that I think will be quite interesting for people to see and hear that probably will revolutionize a lot of the way we look at things going forward. We've got marketeers coming in, panels, we got breakout sessions. What do you think, Chip? If you've been to a number of sessions, you've helped put them on and, and do, do uh, sponsorship through Simmental or even when you were at the university. What's the number one thing you think is the most valuable aspect that you get if you're an attendee at one of these conferences of this magnitude? To be honest, it probably depends upon where you are in your own personal situation, right? I, I, I think probably at different points in my career, I probably would have leaned in more to one aspect or another, be it the social or uh, the on-farm trip to a place like Boyd's for the love of Pete, who, who wouldn't be excited about that, or, or I love me some ponies, or those kind of things. One of the things I always appreciate, though, is that the speakers are both competent, but they're innovative. They're humble, personable folks who are gonna be able to communicate with anybody. They're not looking to be the, to, to talk over everybody else. But they also don't see the world as, there's only one path to success, right? Those folks are gonna be the kind of people who say, well, let us use our knowledge to help you carve your own way. And so I'm not going to tell you I know which piece I'm going to, what I know when I look at your schedule is I'm going to relish every piece in the moment when I'm in it, because I think whether it's the caliber of the speakers, the caliber of the fun, the caliber of the other industry experiences, this is a pretty hard schedule to top. So um, I feel bad for the next breed association who tries to follow you, or maybe when you even try to put together the next yeah, one, because no, no, it's, it's pretty good. No, I, pr I appreciate that. And, and, you know, and I do need to give due credit here to Matt Walfalk, that's one of, uh, works for our performance person on staff, because uh, he put most of this all together. In fact, he, he put it together and I just said, take care of it, Matt. And I didn't have to worry too much about it. Now I can sit here and brag about it. So uh, I do need to give credit to that because you're, you're right. And, and, and Dr. Howard who works with Meyer Foods. And one of the things that I think we probably all lose sight of sometimes that we hopefully can bring back that correlation in this process here in July in Lexington, both, both of you have mentioned it, is we are in the beef business. Yes, most of us are in the purebred business that we're probably reaching out to right now. And yeah, we wanna sell our cows for a lot of money because we're, we're selling genetics. Everybody's selling genetics, even the guys that are selling them for beef, they're gonna be harvested. But the correlation 
to how our product is accepted within the industry and how the consumer is going to take our product is going to determine our success long term, whether everybody believes it or not. So, Jay, give me a little bit of insight on what would you say is the number one thing that you take out of going to a conference like this? That you're going to be have the opportunity to learn um, whether or not being from the speakers or whether or not be from the tours and that. And the importance, of, I think, of knowledge is, is that not only for yourself, but as seed stock producers, you're selling a product at a premium and your customers are expecting you to be knowledgeable. And so rather than, you know, you need to be up on, on genetics, on herd health, on, on grazing and things like that, rather than just saying, you know, I've got this great short horn bull, uh, the weather's great, would you like to buy them? So I think that you need to be, that producers and everybody in sales needs to bring something to the table of relevancy. And it's usually knowledge and here it's gonna be attained. And, and the knowledge is always interesting because recently I had a uh, friend of mine that had a, from central Missouri and a, a Mennonite gentleman that came up in a horse and buggy, a horse and buggy. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't high tech deal. And they started talking and this Mennonite said he was very, uh, he's, he's very aware and, and, and uh, deploying uh, uh, cell grazing. And this friend of mine said to this, this Mennonite, he said, now, how did you learn that? He said, you're really good on that. Oh, he said, I've been to three international conferences outside the United States. And so knowledge is king. And so here's the opportunity for people to come here, learn and take home both their families and to, their, and, and to be a consultant to their clients. And as in sales, consultants make more than salesmen do. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. And, and, and I'm going to add to your comments that I think probably the networking when we're at, at these events, the networking, what we meet one another, the things we share amongst ourselves as producers and, and, and just plain industry people that we share, our love for the industry that we share. I always learn as much in the hallway as I do in the, in the session sometimes. So I, I, there's, there's an advantage when we put a large group of people together, you've got a lot of knowledge as you talked about. That transfer of knowledge can come in a lot of different ways. And, and so I, I think that's another advantage that we see in this. The, the one thing that we were trying to do in our board of directors and, and staff has worked really well at trying to set this up is we want to cover a lot of things. You, you mentioned it, Jay. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk genetics. You know, they have value. Grass management has value. You know, the marketing has value. There are all the aspects that we need to take care of and look at as producers or owners or managers it is is her, just tremendous and and there's we we have become a jack of all trades in a lot of ways but uh so i i i think as we look at this thing that that what i like about what we got put together here is uh we're, we're addressing more than just epds we're going to address more than genomics we're going to address more than just we're going to we're going to try to touch on all of it and stimulate your mind and send you home with some thought process on how you can do all of it a little bit better. And just a little bit better makes a big difference on all that. So do you have any closing remarks for us, Chip, as, as we get ready to wind down this session of the Shorthorn Bullpen? I would just kind of double down on your last comment there that, yeah, you know, day to day, our core competency is genetic prediction, right? That's what we do. But at the same time, it's not really about the numbers for the sake of numbers, right? We're not really, um, not too many people wake up every day and go, oh, I just want to mine data for the sake of mining data. I want to make meaningful tools that can better the plight of different parts of the industry. And so whether it's a discussion of the different genetic tools that can make a packer uh, more successful when Dr. Howard speaks, or if it's uh, Troy Rowan in the middle of the sustainability conversation that he's so immersed in, how do genetic tools aid him in telling that story on a grander scale or helping our commercial clientele do their job better? Um, to me, it's when you get in the hallway and you have those conversations, you realize, okay, day to day, we have to think about how to make elite seed stock that brings genetic merit that has oomph to it. But then if we forget how that tool fits in different segments of the business, we can get off, off kilter just a little bit. And so, and the last thing I would say, and it goes a little bit to Jay's point, that as we expand networking, in the same way that I encourage most serious seed stock folks to find their one or two most serious commercial clients 
and get them invested in genetic evaluation as well because it can be a proving a ground for you. Mm -hmm. In the same way, go find that client or two, that young couple who's just crazy enough to want to be in this business, invite them along on this trip. Um, help them in some fashion if you need to because the for one, it's the right thing to do. It's just the right thing to do. But secondarily, it makes them a more savvy customer of yours, which makes that, that relationship long-term better for everybody. Well, and, and the more I think we can get people from, I'm gonna say a little different walks of life together in one room, we're gonna get more knowledge and more and share more. And that little different walks of life could be multi-breeds or anything else that we run into because we'll have some, some different views and, and that's all right. We share them and take the best out of it. Jay, what's some final comments from you? I think that, I think, you know, two things that become in, in that, and we've talked on one, but the, the other one is, you know, bring a spirit of curiosity to when you come to this, you know, um, years ago, I would, t I, many years ago, okay, many, many years ago, I took a Dale Carnegie course as in public speaking, human relations, and it was whatever you did on Tuesday night, you wanted to take that information and apply to your life on, on Wednesday. And I think, that's the thing here is, is that you, as you come expecting to learn rather than just being surprised that you learn. And the second thing is, is that al along with the networking, uh, just this morning I had a breakfast meeting with some uh, seasoned veteran business people. That means everybody's over 70, including me. So their big thing was four, four take home points. One was networking. And, and in this case, whether or not it be, um, you know, I love the idea of bringing some of your clients along because Quite frankly, this is a very economically priced conference. And so, you know, there's no time better than to invest some money and, and take them along because if you're doing a good job, the more that they know, the better they'll appreciate what you do. No, I, I appreciate that very much. And, and yes, we, we haven't tried to make any money on it. In fact, we, we just want to make it available. And uh, remember, the dates are July 18th, 19th, and 20th, Lexington, Kentucky. We're actually going to be meeting at the Bluegrass Stockyards. We're going to set the, the, the atmosphere right there at the Stockyards. They have a room that's available for it. We're going to feed you three to four meals while you're there. You're going to have some whiskey. You're going to get some uh, tour trips, get to ride the bus. We'll have beer on the bus. We're, go we're going to try to have a good time and still learn quite a little bit for those three days and, and it'll be a lot of fellowship and you'll make some friendships. Um, I guarantee you, you'll make some friendships if you wanna come. You can, you can find this at shorthorn.org on our events page and uh, you know, there's a place to register. It's $250, it's open to everyone. It's not just shorthorn breeders. The program is set up for everyone and we sure invite everyone to come. I wanna thank Chip Kemp for coming in today and, and helping us talk about this and Jay Carlson for helping us talk about this today and, and promote this to you. And we're looking forward to the middle of July, 18th, 19th and 20th in Lexington, Kentucky. So get your reservations and now uh, you can register online. That's it for this episode of the Shorthorn Bullpen. Till next time, this is Monty Souls from the American Shorthorn Association. Mm -hmm.